Today is Wednesday, 13 April, 2022. This will be our first lecture on the essay by Gerald Dworkin. Let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Dworkin, or Professor Dworkin. He was born in 1937. He's still alive, apparently, which makes him, what, 85 years old now. <clears throat> I don't know whether he's still writing and publishing, but I believe he's long since retired from teaching. You shouldn't confuse Gerald Dworkin with another prominent philosopher who died a few years ago, Ronald Dworkin. And as far as I know, they were not related. So philosophy had a couple of Dworkins, and both of them were quite famous, actually. Gerald Dworkin, who's the author of our essay for today, is currently Distinguished Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at the University of California, Davis. Now, emeritus means that he's retired and he has a um, dignified status. When you're emeritus professor, that typically means you have no more duties. Of course, you're no longer paid, but sometimes you're allowed to keep an office and participate in the activities of the department. Uh, Dworkin specialized during his career in moral philosophy, political philosophy, legal philosophy, and also medical ethics, and he made contributions to all of those fields. He has been at UC Davis since 1996. He came there when he was 59 years old, and he's been there ever since. He received his doctoral degree in 1966 when he was 29 years old and he received it from the University of California, Berkeley, which is a different component of the UC system. His dissertation was entitled The Nature and Justification of Coercion, and it was directed by another famous philosopher, Thomas Nagel, who coincidentally is the same age as Gerald Dworkin. So here was a graduate student being taught by someone his own age. Nagel taught briefly at Berkeley from 1963 to 1966, and he's been at New York University for many years now. So he is also 85 and still alive. Ronald, I'm sorry, Gerald Dworkin's book entitled The Theory and Practice of Autonomy, which is a collection of previously published articles, was published in 1988. He edited a book entitled Morality, Harm, and the Law. And just to show you his expertise on this topic of paternalism, he was invited to write the entry on paternalism for the Encyclopedia of Ethics. So people, experts, are invited to write on their uh, special fields, and he was invited to write the entry on paternalism. Well, let's spend today... Uh, most of today, on the definition of paternalism. You may never have heard of it, but it's an important concept. I think when I start giving examples, you'll realize the significance of it. So I have a heading in my lecture notes, which, by the way, were posted as of this morning. If you haven't seen them yet, you may want to pause the video right now, go to Canvas, download and print my lecture notes, which are eight pages long, bring them back, and then when you watch the video, you can follow along, because that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be lecturing from these notes. So I have a section in these notes on page one entitled Lexical Definition and Etymology. So a lexical definition just means a definition of how the word is actually used at a time and place. The etymology of a word tells you how it came into existence, when did it originate? And how did it develop over time? So let's begin with a dictionary definition. This is from my new Oxford American Dictionary, third edition. It was published in the year 2010, just 12 years ago. The word paternalism, according to that dictionary, means the following. The policy or practice on the part of people in positions of authority of restricting freedom and responsibilities of those subordinate to them in the subordinate's supposed best interest, 
And then there's an example of the use of the word. Here it is. The arrogance and paternalism that underlies cradle-to-grave employment contracts. So let's pick, it, let's pick it apart. The first thing you should notice is that paternalism is a policy or perhaps a practice. We could call a particular act an act of paternalism, but paternalism itself, as the, as the suffix ism suggests, is some kind of practice or policy or institution. It's a practice or policy on the part of people in positions of authority. So paternalism isn't typically something done by people who are on the same level, like this. It's done in a hierarchical situation where someone up here is in a position of authority over someone down here. It could be parent and child. It could be teacher and student. It could be, it could be in a religious setting where some authority figure in a church does something to one of the parishioners and so on. It could be in the military. It could be in law, it could be in medicine, or it could be in society generally. So the key idea is that someone is in a position of authority over someone else and does something. What does that person do? That person restricts either the freedom or the responsibilities of those who are subordinate. So the person up here in a position of authority restricts the liberty or the responsibilities of those down below, which we'll call subordinates. And this may be the most important element of all. When you paternalize somebody, you at least claim to be doing it for the good of the person you're paternalizing. So a parent, for example, may make a child eat vegetables. The child may not like the taste of vegetables, and may resist eating them. The parent says, too bad. You're going to eat your vegetables because they're good for you. It's in your best interest to eat a varied diet, one that includes vegetables. So the parent restricts the liberty of the child for the child's own good. And you can imagine the government doing that. What if agents of the government enacted rules or policies that restrict the liberty of the people and claim that it's for their own good. Now, you're not a child and I'm not a child, so the situation may be different. Maybe it's permissible to restrict the liberty of a child for that child's own good. But many people think that it's not legitimate for the government to restrict the liberty of adult citizens for their own good. Many people would resist that and say, that's wrong, right? I'm an adult. I have a right to make decisions of my own. I have a right to take risks. I have a right to be wrong. I have a right to be foolish. And I don't appreciate government trying to restrict my liberty on the ground that what I'm about to do is not good for me. It's not in my long-term best interest. So I hope that gives you an a general idea of what paternalism is. You'll see as we proceed that philosophers have made certain distinctions between different types of paternalism. There may even be different understandings of paternalism. Two or more philosophers may disagree among themselves about what exactly paternalism is. So all we've done so far is look at a dictionary definition. And the old saying is, a dictionary is a good place to start a philosophical investigation, but it's a bad place to stop it. In other words, there's nothing wrong with going to a dictionary if you're trying to understand a particular concept or idea. Go to the dictionary, look it up, see what it says. It may, in all likelihood, if it's a good dictionary, it'll give you the basic features of the, of the idea or concept that you're investigating. But then you need to go from there because dictionaries are not always correct. Sometimes they're simplistic. Sometimes a dictionary will omit uh, the details or subtleties or nuances 
Once again, a dictionary is a good place to start a philosophical investigation, but not so good a place to stop it. Okay, let's look at the etymology of the word, which means where did it come from? The word paternalism comes from a Latin word, pater, which means father. And you may have heard the expression, father knows best. Right? Uh, the idea is that in a family, in a home, the father knows best for what, what's best for other members of the family. Now, that ignores the mother, of course. It may be that the term, the phrase, father knows best, is sexist because it assumes that the male parent, the father, is has a superior understanding or authority uh, to, the, to the female parent, the, mo the mother. But anyway, that's the origin of the word. It comes from the Latin word pater, which means father. Now, maybe we could, if we wanted to, get rid of the sexist term paternalism and coin a non-sexist term. We could come up with a term like parentalism, right? There are, there are male parents and female parents. So rather than pick one of them out, why don't we call this idea parentalism? So that would be preferable to the term paternalism, if only because it's not limited to just one parent. It's not sexist, in other words. Unfortunately, the term paternalism is widely used in philosophy and in other areas. So if you are going to coin a new term, other people may not understand you. You'll have to explain it to everyone, and that may not be possible. So many philosophers throw up their hands in frustration and say, I'm going to have to continue to use the word paternalism, even though I object to the sexism of the term. Maybe one day the term parentalism will become more popular, and maybe, let's say, 50 years from now, it will be widely understood by philosophers that it's uh, the, the appropriate term. It will have come to replace the sexist term paternalism. By the way, if, if you look at my notes, you can see I did a Google search. In fact, I did it this morning. I just typed paternalism into the search box, and it came up immediately with 9 million hits. So I guess that means that the word paternalism appears in appears 9 million times in various documents that have been searched by Google's uh, spiders, if you will. The term parentalism, by contrast, generated only 961,000 hits. So the term paternalism is roughly 10 times more popular than the term parentalism. I wonder what it would look like a year from now. Maybe a year from now, the term parentalism will have crept up on the term paternalism. Maybe instead of a 10 to 1 or 9 to 1 ratio, maybe it'll be 4 to 1 or 5 to 1. And maybe 10 years from now, it'll be equal. So. That's where things stand right now. I'm going to continue using the term paternalism because that's the term that's most widely used in philosophy. There's another example I thought of, of a term that has unfortunately crept into philosophical discourse. Are you familiar with the biblical parable of the Samaritan or what's sometimes called the Good Samaritan? I looked up the term Samaritan in my uh, online, in the Merriam-Webster online dictionary, and it says, from the parable of the Good Samaritan in the book of Luke, a person who is generous in helping those in distress. So a Samaritan is someone who's generous, who goes out of his or her way to help others, even strangers. So what should we call someone who comes upon an injured person and is in a position to help, but refuses to do so and continues walking. That person, we would say, is a non-Samaritan, right? You're, you didn't act as a Samaritan would. So you would think that the appropriate terms would be Samaritan and non-Samaritan. 
But guess what terms are used in philosophical articles and books? The terms are Good Samaritan and Bad Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is the Samaritan who renders assistance to those in need. The Bad Samaritan is someone who doesn't. Now, if it were up to me, I would change the terminology. I would, I would change the terminology to Samaritan, non-Samaritan, instead of good and bad Samaritan. Sometimes terminology develops that is uh, unfortunate and would be better replaced by alternative terminology. Okay, let's turn to page two. I'll be happy, I'll be very happy if we can finish pages two and three of my lecture notes for today. That would leave us two days to finish this article by Dworkin, and then we'll move on to the final item of the semester. So let's see how far we get today. Again, I'd like to finish pages two and three. Two and three, all fall, pages two and three, all fall under the heading types of question. And this is a general philosophical discussion, but you'll, I'll use paternalism as my example as we go. In general, there are three different types of question that a person could ask and try to answer. And philosophers have taken pains to distinguish these three types of question so that they're not confused with one another. And that's one of the distinctive things about philosophy. Philosophy strives for clarity and rigor. Philosophers try to avoid confusion, and they try to prevent people from falling into various confusions. Sometimes when two people are arguing, it, look, it only looks like they're having a conflict. But a philosopher who looks upon that supposed conflict realizes that the parties in question are using a key term in different ways. So really, they're not butting heads, they're missing each other. They're passing like ships in the night. And they didn't even realize it. Why didn't they realize it? Because they were using the same word in different ways. One of them, for example, may have been using the word paternalism to mean such and such, the other one was using the same word, paternalism, to mean so-and-so. And so because they were using the same word, they thought that they were disagreeing. In fact, a philosopher would listen in on their conversation and say, whoa, wait a minute, you two are not really disagreeing because you're using that term in a different way, in different ways. You need to pick one of the meanings of the word, and both of you need to use that. You both need to use the word in the same way. And then you may well get a disagreement, but maybe not. Maybe you will find that you agree once you stipulate the meaning of the word. Now, one of my teachers, Joel Feinberg, wrote the following in one of his books. He said, conceptual clarification is the most distinctively philosophical of enterprises. It's not the only thing philosophers do, but it's certainly one of the main ones. Conceptual clarification. That means clarifying and analyzing concepts or ideas to make sure that people don't get confused. So different types of question call for different types of answer. Here are some of the questions raised by paternalism. And if you scan pages two and three, you'll notice that there are three types. And you'll see where the first type takes almost the whole of page two. These are conceptual questions, okay? At the very bottom of page two, you'll see the second type. They're factual or empirical questions. And in about the middle of page three, you'll see the third type of question. Uh, these are evaluative or normative questions. So, three different types of question, and depending on what, types of, what type of question you ask, the method for answering it will differ. You answer a factual question in a different way from the way you would answer an evaluative question or a conceptual question. So it's always important to know 
what kind of question you're asking or somebody is asking. That way you know how to go about answering that question. So let's take these one at a time and I'll illustrate each of them with the topic of paternalism. Let's begin with the conceptual question. These, and I'm reading from my notes now, these, type, these questions in general, not dealing specifically with paternalism, but in general, conceptual questions are questions about the nature or content of ideas, concepts, or categories, including how they are related to one another. Now, to take a simple example, there's not universal agreement on what a bachelor is. Some people have a very simple understanding of what a bachelor is. They say a bachelor is just an unmarried male. But when you think about it, that's not adequate. Doesn't the person in question have to be an adult? Wouldn't it be odd to describe a newborn baby boy as a bachelor? So that suggests that the definition unmarried male needs to be filled in, maybe unmarried adult male. And even that is not adequate because there are unmarried adult males who are not bachelors because they're not eligible to marry. Would you describe the Pope as a bachelor? He's an unmarried adult male. And yet it sounds odd to call the Pope bachelor. And the reason for that, when you think about it, is that the Pope is not even eligible to marry. So because of that, he's taken out of the realm of bachelorhood. So notice we're getting more and more refined as we go. A bachelor now is at least the following, an unmarried adult male who's eligible to be married. And even that may not be adequate. We could keep going with it and try to specify all of the necessary conditions for being a bachelor. So what I've just done with the concept of a bachelor is start to analyze it. And that's something philosophers do. You can ask this kind of question about almost anything. What is justice? What is liberty? What is equality? What is art? What is law? One of the most famous books written in philosophy of law has the title, The Concept of Law. It was published in 1961 by the British philosopher H.L.A. Hart. He wrote a whole book on the concept or idea of law. I also have in my book collection a book entitled The Idea of Wilderness. It might well have been entitled The Concept of Wilderness. What exactly is a wilderness? Is it, is it, is it the same as a wooded area? Are all wooded areas wildernesses? Maybe not. Maybe it takes something else in order for a wooded area to be a wilderness. Maybe it doesn't have to be a wooded area at all. Can't there be a, a desert wilderness where there are no trees at all? Um, that sort of thing. So philosophers love exploring concepts or ideas and trying to get clear on what they are. Not just for its own sake, but typically philosophers try to clarify concepts so that they can ask meaningful, factual questions and evaluative questions about them. And often it's just to avoid confusion, as I said earlier. So here are some examples of conceptual questions, all of which have to do with paternalism. First of all, what is paternalism? What is it? Exactly, in detail. Okay, I won't try to answer it right now, but that is a conceptual question. We might ask the following. Given that we have an understanding of what paternalism is, we can ask what types of paternalism are there? We might distinguish between legal paternalism and medical paternalism. In other words, paternalism practiced by lawyers and judges or the legal system as a whole versus paternalism practiced by doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals. We could distinguish between hard and soft paternalism, and some philosophers have done that. We'll come back to that in a moment. Some people call them distinguish between strong and weak paternalism. 
Dworkin is going to distinguish between pure paternalism and impure paternalism. Again, we'll come back to that later. And so on. So once we get an idea of what paternalism is, we can try to divide it up into different types and show how they're related. Here are four famous essays on paternalism and the dates in which they were published. My teacher, again, Joel Feinberg, wrote a famous essay in 1971, 51 years ago, entitled Legal Paternalism. This is Paternalism in the Law by Legal Authorities. A year later, the essay that we're about to start discussing, or that we currently are discussing, by Gerald Dworkin is, was published. That's 50 years ago. It's entitled simply Paternalism. Another of my teachers in 1978, before he was my teacher, Alan Buchanan, published an essay entitled Medical Paternalism. By the way, the three members of my dissertation committee at the University of Arizona were Joel Feinberg, Alan Buchanan, and a man named Ron Milo. And it's interesting that two of those three wrote famous essays on the topic, the topic of paternalism. And so I felt very blessed when I studied under Joel and Alan uh, that I could learn about paternalism from them. The fourth essay was published by Gerald Dworkin in 2005. Many years later, he called it moral paternalism. So there are many articles and books published on this topic. Those are just four of the main ones. And I put them in there because you can see that the, there are adjectives. Dworkin's essay was entitled Paternalism. Feinberg added the adjective legal. Buchanan added the adjective medical. And Dworkin added the adjective moral. Now, someone might, an article, write, might write an article entitled religious paternalism or military paternalism or parental paternalism. Okay, so these are just four examples of work done by philosophers on the topic of paternalism. Now, let's be a little more specific. A moment ago, I said that some philosophers distinguish between hard and soft paternalism. What's the difference? Here is how Feinberg distinguishes the two. And I'm quoting him here from one of his books. Hard paternalism will accept as a reason for criminal legislation that it is necessary to protect competent adults against their will from the harmful consequences even of their fully voluntary choices and undertakings. Now that's a pretty hard doctrine, isn't it? Maybe that's why Feinberg called it hard paternalism. We have, a, we have an adult who is competent. It's not an adult who's retarded or suffering from some other intellectual disability. It's not someone who's senile or demented. It's not a child. It's a competent adult like you and me. And this competent adult is being interfered with by some authority. And the claim by the authority is that it's for the, it's for the good of the person who's being paternalized. And it's against that person's will. So imagine some authority telling me, Keith, you can't ride your bike today. It's too windy. People, the wind may knock you down and injure you, or worse, it could kill you. If the wind blows you off your bike and you fall into the path of an oncoming car, you may be killed. So Keith, in spite of your desire to ride today, your willingness to ride today, we're not gonna let you, but it's for your own good. Now that's not gonna please me. I'm gonna say, no, I'm an adult, I'm competent, I wanna ride my bike. And while that may be risky, I'm aware of the risks, I'm aware of the dangers, and I voluntarily accept them. Okay? So that would be hard paternalism. And there are people who 
believe that hard paternalism is justifiable. There are people who believe that it's justifiable, defensible, morally permissible for agents of government to limit the liberty of competent adults against their will for their own good. Many people oppose that, but some support it. So what we have here is a disagreement. Philosophers differ as to whether hard paternalism is justifiable, and they make arguments to try to persuade each other and to try to persuade people whose mind isn't made up yet. Okay, let's turn to soft paternalism. Some people think that soft paternalism isn't really paternalism at all, but let's, let's define it as Feinberg does. Here's what he says in that same book, on the same page. Soft paternalism holds that the state has the right to prevent self-regarding harmful conduct, and Feinberg adds in parentheses, so far it looks paternalistic, when but only when that conduct is substantially non-voluntary or when temporary intervention is necessary to establish whether it is voluntary or not. Now let's talk about that for a minute, a couple minutes. Feinberg is saying, imagine a situation where the authorities are fairly sure that the person they're about to interfere with is not uh, acting in a voluntary way. The person may be laboring under some misconception or may have a false factual belief or may be acting under some compulsion, a compulsion to steal or to commit suicide. In a case like that, Feinberg says, it would be only soft paternalism for the authorities to intervene, right? Because the authorities are saying, look, we're not really going against your will. You are acting in a non-voluntary way. You are, not in your, you are not in the proper frame of mind to be making a decision. So we're going to protect you from your own folly by limiting your liberty. That would be an act of soft paternalism. Another example is where the authorities aren't sure whether you're acting voluntarily. And so they intervene, they restrict your liberty, they apprehend you, and then they may take you in for testing to see whether you have some uh, mental illness or some other uh, impediment to uh, understanding or will. Okay, so imagine someone is on a ledge threatening to jump several stories to the street below. The authorities have an opportunity to grab you and pull you in before you jump. Now, the authorities don't know whether what's going on in your life. They, they don't know whether you are depressed. Uh, they don't know whether maybe you've just lost your job or your spouse has left you. Maybe uh, a loved one has died and you're acting uh, you're not in a uh, you're right you're not in the proper frame of mind to be making an important decision like whether to continue living. The authorities will almost certainly apprehend you, grab you, get you off the ledge, and then take you in for um, observation diagnosis. And presumably, if they determine that you are competent and that you are acting voluntarily, they would have to let you go and decide for yourself what to do. Unless, of course, they're hard paternalists. If they're hard paternalists, they may well detain you even though you're competent and acting voluntarily. So Feinberg says that, he says elsewhere, soft paternalism isn't really paternalism because the authorities are not going against your will, right? They are facilitating your will. You don't really want to die if you're threatening to jump because you have a false belief or because you're acting under some illness, some mental illness, right? That act of jumping would not fulfill your will. 
It would not be an act of will. It's not really you deciding to jump. And so if the authorities stopped you, they're not acting against your will, as they would be in a case of hard paternalism. So that's just an example of a good philosopher, in this case, Joel Feinberg, making an important distinction. He says, let's look at paternalism. Can't we distinguish these cases of hard paternalism versus the cases of soft paternalism? And of the two, which would you say is easier to justify? Is it easier to justify hard paternalism, where you are acting against the will of a competent adult? Or is it easier to justify soft paternalism, where you're trying to fulfill the desires of the person you're restricting? Clearly, it's easier to justify soft paternalism than it is to justify hard paternalism. In fact, many people think that you can't justify hard paternalism at all. Okay. In fact, down below in my notes, Feinberg says on his page 16, soft paternalism is really no kind of paternalism at all. So if there's anything wrong with pulling that person off the ledge, it's not wrong because it's paternalistic. It must be wrong for some other reason. Because according to Feinberg, it's not paternalistic to uh, apprehend people who are about to harm themselves gravely in order to find out whether they're competent in acting voluntarily. Okay, another question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I skipped over something in my notes. I've been using the word voluntary and voluntariness. What does that mean? Well, here are some, here are some conditions that undermine or vitiate voluntariness. Ignorance. If the person on the ledge believes that jumping off the ledge to the street will, um, I don't know, help him win the lottery, that's a false belief, right? That's, that person is laboring under a, an impediment that that person is not acting voluntarily because his or her belief about the consequences or the nature of the act is false, right? We would apprehend that person and try to show that person that jumping off the ledge will not have any effect on whether that person wins the lottery, right? So that's a crazy false belief. So any kind of ignorance would tend to undermine voluntariness. In fact, uh, people in the law often claim ignorance. They say, well, uh, yes, I performed the act, but I thought I was doing such and such when I performed the act. I know, it was, I, know I wasn't doing such and such, but I truly believed that I was. And the person is claiming to, be act, to have acted under um, a condition of ignorance. The person said, I had a false belief, and that's why I acted the way I did. Now, you've probably heard the expression, ignorance of the law is no excuse. That is not in general correct. Sometimes ignorance of the law is an excuse. And also, sometimes ignorance of the facts is a legal excuse. So that's one of those legal slogans that is either outright false or uh, dangerous because it's sometime, only sometimes true. Okay, so ignorance would tend to undermine voluntariness, misunderstanding, which is related to ignorance, things like intellectual disability or retardation, mental retardation. What if you claim to have been coerced? What if someone put a gun to your head and said, do X or else? Are you acting voluntarily? Probably not. You would say, I had no choice. I was being coerced. There was a gun to my head. My behavior was not voluntary. What if you were compelled to do something, either by another person or by the weather? What if the uh, wind is blowing so strong that you can't hold on to something and it flies away and hurts somebody? 
you, were, you may be charged with a crime, uh, you can defend yourself by claiming that your, your action was compelled. You, had, you were overwhelmed by the wind and couldn't hang on. Right? So there was a kind of compulsion to your behavior. Remember the case of the spelunkers? They might have argued that they were compelled to kill and eat uh, poor Wetmore. Uh, they would say that their action is not voluntary. Of course, the statute in that, in that case didn't say anything about voluntary, uh, as I recall. So that was not likely to succeed. What about derangement? You could claim that you were deranged at the time you acted, and that undermines your voluntariness. Intoxication. If you're, in if you're in drunk or intoxicated um, and do something, you can claim that you didn't act voluntarily. So there are a lot of things that undermine voluntariness. Okay, a couple more examples of these conceptual questions. How is paternalism related to moralism, autonomy, coercion, and beneficence? Now, I'm not going to go into detail about what those terms mean, but, but I'm sorry, paternalism is related to all of those concepts, and a good philosopher would want to draw out the relationships between them and clarify the relationships. Uh, for example, what's the relationship between paternalism and beneficence? That would be a good philosophical topic for, a, for an article. And finally, a conceptual question might take the following form. Are helmet laws paternalistic? Uh, some states have laws that require that if you're driving a motorcycle on a highway or even a bicycle, you must wear a helmet. Let's limit ourselves to motorcycles because that's the more common case. Is a law that requires people to wear a helmet while riding a motorcycle on a highway? Is that a case of paternalism? Does the concept of paternalism apply to that law? Is that a paternalistic law? So that's an example of a philosophical question. Okay, let's turn to the second of the three types of question. These are the factual or empirical questions. These types of questions in general are questions about how things are, including how the law is. They're not questions about ideas or concepts or categories. They're questions about the world. How is the world? How are things? The, the objective here is to get the truth about how things are. It's, it's not to make a judgment of good or bad. It's not, a, it's not to make a judgment of what ought to be done or ought not to be done. The goal here is just to get the facts, the truth. Uh, this is the kind of inquiry that a scientist would make, either a natural scientist who's studying the natural world or a social scientist who is studying the social world. Okay? So these are questions that are designed to elicit the facts, the truth about how things actually are. Notice that each of these questions, these factual questions, presupposes an answer to the underlying conceptual question. And my first example will illustrate that. Suppose somebody asks the following question, how pervasive or widespread is paternalism? Well, you can't very well answer that question until you clarify the concept. How pervasive is paternalism? We don't know until we specify what paternalism is, and that requires a conceptual analysis. So the, the conceptual questions get answered first, and once we get a clear understanding of the concept, we can then ask a series of factual questions. Okay, so the same thing is true of, a, of rape. Uh, I've written a couple of books and many articles on rape. And someone might wonder, how pervasive is rape? Well, you can't answer that question until you get clear on what rape is. 
It's a contested concept. R the term rape has a meaning in the law, and in some cases that meaning has changed over time. Other people use the term rape in a broader way than the, the way the law uses it. So you can't answer the question how pervasive rape is or whether there's more rape now than there was a year ago until you clarify the concept. And once you clarify it, then you can go out into the world and look around and count up the cases and answer the question, the factual question. Okay, here's another factual question. Is paternalism waxing, waning, or remaining constant? Waxing just means increasing in size or scope or number. Waning is the opposite. It means decreasing in size, scope, or number. And the, other, the third possibility is it's staying constant. It's, not, it's neither waxing nor waning. The moon is an example of something that waxes and wanes. We, we describe the moon when it's becoming full as a waxing moon. And when the moon is moving from full to a new moon, which is not visible, we call that a, wa a waning moon. Okay, so we can ask, is paternalism waxing, waning, or remaining constant? Once again, we need to clarify the concept before we can go out into the world and look around. Which countries or cultures exhibit the most paternalism and why? That's a factual question. That's the kind of question a social scientist would try to answer. Uh, as for which social scientist, maybe um, a sociologist would be equipped to go out and do a survey or a study and, and get an answer to that question. Also notice the why part. Well, suppose we uncover facts and we, and we discover that a particular country, I'll just call it country A, has more paternalism in it than country B. We've discovered that as a fact. The next thing we might wonder about is why? Why does country A exhibit more paternalistic behavior than country B? What is it about these two countries that, that leads to the different rates of paternalism? It could have to do with some peculiarity of these countries. Uh, maybe one of them uh, has a history, excuse me, maybe their histories differ. One of them may have a history of war and conflict. The other country may happen to have a history of peace, uh, peaceableness or peacefulness. And maybe that's the explanation for why one of them is more paternalistic than the other. So again, this is the kind of question a social scientist would try to answer. Next one. How do people react to being paternalized? That's a factual question. Maybe a psychologist would study that, or again, a sociologist. Some people might respond or react to paternal, being paternalized with resentment. I, res I, I suggested that earlier. I resent my own government treating me like a child. Even if the government is well-intended even if the government is motivated by my good or my happiness, I still resent it. I get to decide as an adult how to live my life, which risks are worth taking, and so on. So resentment is a common reaction to being paternalized. But someone might actually be grateful. Maybe you're among them. Someone who is paternalized might later be grateful for it. Someone might say to an authority, at the time you intervened in my life, I was upset. I wasn't happy. I didn't want you restricting my liberty. But now that I understand why you did it, now that I understand that your motive was my own good, I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you for caring enough about me to get involved in my life and protect me from my own folly, from my own unwise decision. Okay, that could happen. Maybe a child who had to eat vegetables during childhood has now grown up into adulthood. You may one day have a conversation with your parents 
And you may say something like this, maybe in a humorous way. You know, I always hated those peas and you made me eat them two or three times a week. We had peas with our meal and you made me eat them. At the time, I was resentful and frustrated and even angry. But now that I'm an adult and have children of my own, I'd like to tell you that you did the right thing. You knew what was good for me. You gave me what I needed, not just what I wanted. And I'd like to thank you for that. I've grown up strong and healthy, largely because of the interferences that you made in my life, the restrictions on my liberty. So that's a factual question. How do people react to being paternalized? Next question, are there some forms of paternalism that people don't mind? And if there are, which ones? Some people don't mind being paternalized financially. For example, you as a worker in this country will be required to contribute to, a so to the social security system, which means when you, if and when you reach retirement age, you will have a sum of money that has been collected for you that you can draw upon and live on. Many people, many young people don't like having this money taken out of their weekly or monthly paychecks. They, they think it's paternalistic. They say, the government is taking money out of my check for my use later in my life. They're treating me like a child. I would rather have that money so that I can invest it. I could probably make more money investing it, someone might say, than the government does. Um, so I resent the government paternalizing me in this way. Uh, other people are happy. Other people are happy that the government takes money out of their paycheck. And the reasoning is something like this. If the government hadn't taken that money out and put it away for me, I would have spent it. Surely, I know myself, I would have blown it on things that I didn't need and I would have reached retirement age with no savings. Thank God the government took the money out of my check it took, took the choice out of my hands and it took the money and put it away for me so that when I retired, I had a, stock, a sum of money to live on. So I think many people don't mind, not everybody, but many people don't mind financial paternalism where somebody wiser um, makes financial decisions for you that, are, that work out for your, your own good later in your life. What about medical paternalism? Uh, many people do not mind if a doctor, if their doctor makes decisions for them for their own good. Instead of a doctor asking, uh, what do you want me to do in this situation? Here are your choices. Here are the consequences of each choice. What do you want me to do? Some people don't want to be presented with that question. Some people would say to the doctor, doctor, I want you to decide. I want you to choose the therapy that you think is best for me, given my condition and my, the kind of life that you know I want to have. I want you to decide. That's medical paternalism. And that's the topic of Alan Buchanan's essay that I mentioned from page two doctors and nurses and other medical professionals making decisions for their patients. Uh, that's a kind of paternalism. And what I'm saying right now is some or many patients don't mind. In fact, some patients request it. They don't trust themselves. They believe their doctor will act in their best interest and using the doctor's knowledge and skill, and they want the doctor to do that. Next question, we're almost done. Is there a legal right not to be paternalized? Notice that's a factual question about the law. And the proper person to answer that is not a scientist, but a lawyer. A trained lawyer in that area of law could tell you, is there a legal right? Do I have a legal right in the law as it now stands not to be paternalized. And if I do, 
what is my remedy if that right is violated? If I have a legal right not to be paternalized, then someone may, well, violate it. What's my remedy if that happens? That's the kind of question you would ask a trained lawyer. And finally, is there a legal right to be paternalized? Notice, the first question was, is there a legal right not to be paternalized? We could turn it around and ask, is there a legal right to be paternalized? If so, under what conditions? Again, that's a factual question about the law, and a lawyer would be the appropriate person to answer it. All right, you still with me? We've now explored, with using paternalism as our example, we've explored conceptual questions about paternalism, and now we've explored factual or empirical questions. Let's turn to the third type of question and look at some examples. The third type of question is evaluative. Notice that word has a V-A-L-U in it, which is the root of the word value. Evaluative questions are questions about values or questions that engage or implicate values. Normative questions are questions about norms. Norms are standards of behavior, for example. So there's, uh, these questions have to do with, well, just read what I wrote here. These in general are questions about how things ought to be, including how the law ought to be. So we can always ask of any given law, is it justified? Should it be on the books? Maybe it shouldn't. That's an evaluative question about the law. Notice that these questions, like factual questions, presuppose answers to the underlying conceptual question. So let's look at the first one. The first question on my list is, is paternalism defensible or justified? Now stop right there. We'll continue with it in a moment. Is paternalism defensible? Is it justifiable? Is it justified? You can't answer that evaluative question until you get clear on what paternalism is. We saw earlier that hard paternalism is harder to justify than soft paternalism. So if the question is, is paternalism justified? The answer to that will differ depending on what type of paternalism we're looking at. Hard paternalism may be justified, whereas, I'm sorry, hard paternalism may be unjustified, whereas soft paternalism may be justified. So first you get clear on the concept, then you ask the factual or evaluative question. Do you see that? Okay, let's continue with this first bulleted item. Is paternalism defensible or justified? If so, on what grounds? and under what conditions. So let's be, let's be specific. Exactly when and where and why is a particular type of paternalism justified? Now, there's an interesting example. Sarah Conley, who is a philosopher who teaches at Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine, recently wrote a book entitled Against Autonomy. And without going into the details, here is a quotation that I took from the cover of her book. In this book, Sarah Conley rejects the idea of autonomy as inviolable. In other words, she thinks that autonomy can sometimes be violated, justifiably. Drawing on sources from behavioral economics and social psychology, she argues that we are often, we are so often irrational in making our decisions that our autonomous choices often undercut the achievement of our own goals. Thus, in many cases, it would advance our goals more effectively if government, government were to prevent us from acting in accordance with our decisions, unquote. Now, that sounds like Feinberg's soft paternalism, doesn't it? This is a case where people are being foolish and they're doing things that are not really in their 
long-term rational self-interest. So the government steps in, limits their liberty in a certain way in order to make, get them to make the right decision, the decision that is in their long-term rational self-interest. So Conley here, at least in this quotation, Conley is saying that soft paternalism, which is Feinberg's term, soft paternalism is justifiable, at least sometimes. Get, get this, elsewhere in her book, she argues that hard paternalism is justifiable, that there are cases where government may legitimately restrict the liberty of competent adults against their will for their own good. So Connolly is a hardliner. She thinks that hard paternalism, as well as soft paternalism, is sometimes justifiable. It's an interesting book. You may want to pick it up and read it. Next question. Do people have a moral right not to be paternalized? That's a normative question. That's an evaluative question because it's about whether there is a moral right, not a legal right. A, the question, is there a legal right not to be paternalized? That's a factual question about the law. If the question is, do people have a moral right not to be paternalized? That's a, not a factual question. That is an evaluative question. And you would need to argue for it. You don't go out and ask a lawyer for an answer to that question because it's not factual. You have to engage in argumentation. You have to support your answer. If you say, yes, people have a moral right not to be paternalized, the reply by someone will be, support that. Give me a reason to accept that. Make an argument. And once you make an argument, of course, the, the other person may find fault with it. Next question. Should the law, should the law allow paternalism? Should the law allow paternalism? Notice the word should. That's the telltale sign that you've got an evaluative or normative question. Should or ought the law to allow paternalism? If so, by whom and under what conditions? Next, should there be a legal right not to be paternalized? That's a moral question about the law. It's not a factual question. It's not, is there in fact a legal right not to be paternalized? It's whatever the law happens to be, should there be a law against, I'm sorry, should there be a legal right not to be paternalized? That's a moral question about the law. Next, should there be a legal right to be paternalized? Should people have the right to request paternalizing behavior from the government or a financial advisor or someone else. Next, is there a moral presumption against paternalism? That's a, an evaluative question. And that's because we're asking whether there is a moral presumption. If the question was, is there a legal presumption against paternalism? That would be a factual question about the law. And you would go to a lawyer to get an answer to that. But if we're asking whether there is a moral presumption, we're once again inviting argument. You don't go to a lawyer to answer that question. Lawyers have no evaluative expertise. Their expertise lies elsewhere. And if there is a moral presumption against paternalism, we can ask what suffices to rebut that presumption. You'll see when we get to this part of the essay, Gerald Dworkin believes that there is a moral presumption against paternalism. In other words, the default position should be that there is no paternalism. And that default position can be changed only if you give good reasons for it, okay? So there's, Dworkin argues that there should be a moral uh, presumption against paternalism. And the final question is, should there be a legal presumption against paternalism? 
You know that in the law, there's a presumption of innocence. The law presumes that criminal defendants are innocent until, unless and until the state, the prosecutor, proves otherwise. Maybe the law should have a presumption like that, where anybody who wants to paternalize anybody has to make a case for it. The default rule might be no paternalism. And those people who want to be able to paternalize would have to rebut that presumption. The burden is on them to shoulder the, uh, well, the burden is on them to uh, rebut the presumption, if you will, or to change the default position. Okay, that's a lot. We've covered a lot of ground. We really haven't gotten to Dworkin's essay yet. We're going to start that on uh, the next essay next week. But I've laid the groundwork. We've, we've done philosophy today. We, uh, we looked at different types of question. We illustrated the three different types with questions drawn from the topic for today, which is paternalism. And some of what we've said today will come back during our discussion of Dworkin. So I propose that in our next lecture, we cover pages four and five of my lecture notes. I think we can do that much. And on the following day next week, the second lecture next week, we'll finish up the article, which is pages six and seven of my lecture notes, a little bit on page eight. So I tried to divide up the essay into three roughly equal parts and uh, cover them in my three lectures. So that's it for today. We've gone an hour and seven minutes almost. I'll get this lecture posted uh, in a little while, a few hours, and um, I'd like you to have a good weekend, a good day, a good weekend, and I'll see you back on the screen next week. Okay, take care.